Pentecost then, what we've seen so far is that um, the fine flower um, that we've seen already, uh, the fine flower depicts Christ's nature in the believer, whereas the leaven depicts the old nature which remains in the present life, and we know that leaven is a picture of sin, and we've looked at that in Ephesians chapter 4, and the two loaves depict both Jews and Gentiles brought nigh uh, to God through Christ. So the two loaves, these two people groups come together. So we can say that there's no such thing as Jew or Gentile in the church of God. There's no more bond or free. So no one's who is born free. And have you managed to look that up? Born free. Okay. And uh, those that are born into slavery, there's no such thing. God doesn't make any distinction uh, with people groups or anything like that, male or female. Uh, no distinction groups. They all come nigh in the blood of Christ. So that all men can be saved. John 3.16. For God so loved the world. He didn't say, so God so loved the Jewish people that he sent his only begotten son. So he loved the world. And we all might be saved. Okay, so when we start this evening then, we want to look at verse 18. Now, I don't know. I don't know. My aim is to try and finish. But as Johan said, there's a few more slides to go through. It depends on how much I speak in between times. But verse 18, okay? So, verse 17 speaks about the two loaves. Okay, the two loaves. We've looked at that already uh, a number of weeks. Let's begin then looking at verse 18. And ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year. Okay, so let's just stop there. They were to offer seven lambs. Now the lambs were to be a, a particular, not breeding, not a breed, but they were to be without blemish. Okay, there was, nothing was to be wrong with them. Okay, so they couldn't go out and say, oh this one is bl born blind, or this one is, has got an issue, it's, it's fly blown, or something like that, or we forgot to cut off its tail, and now it's got all dags, and, and it's fly, fly blown, and it's, so it's sickly, or this one here has got sleepy sickness, and, and so therefore we can take these, no, they had to be without blemish. They had to be pure. And every sacrifice that they brought with the lamb or the kid had to be a pure one. Okay, They couldn't just go out and find one that was lame or anything like that that was useless uh, to be bred from. It had to be without blemish. Okay, <coughs> That makes it quite... It, it's important for us to know that because that pictures Christ. When John the Baptist saw the Lord Jesus Christ coming, what did he say? Behold the Amen. Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And which Lamb could take away the sin of the world? The book of Hebrews says, No amount of blood of bulls and of goats could ever take away the sin of mankind. So this picture that it speaks about Christ. So when we read about lambs and things like that, we need to be thinking automatically, Is this a picture of Christ? Is this a picture of Christ? And, and why, and, and the question I asked and when I was doing my readings and things, why seven? Why not just one? Because there was only one Christ, there wasn't seven Christs. And so we read that these seven lambs, they had to be without blemish and they had to be of the first year. The first year. So that they couldn't wait for that lamb to grow up and maybe have uh, a, a lamb itself, because then obviously it doesn't become a lamb anymore. Um, so it had to be of the first year. It had to be without blemish. It had to be <coughs> of the first year. Of the first year. Okay? And so we want to look at this, this question. Why seven? Why seven? Why seven lambs? Let's in, in preparation for that, I want us to turn to Acts chapter 27. Acts tw chapter 27. You might think, why are we going here? After we read the verse, you might still say, why are we here? Acts chapter 27 and verse 37. Okay, 
Okay, so we have <coughs> Paul, obviously, um, taken taken a, into the ship, and, and etc. Uh, verse 33, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried, and continued fasting, having taken nothing, etc. And then we get down to verse 37. And it says, And we were in all the ship two hundred three score and sixteen souls. <coughs> Was that important? Well, every word in Scripture seems to be important, doesn't it? If every word in the fact of Scripture is indeed inspired, why did the Holy Spirit record for us that there were exactly 276 people on board Paul's ship? Okay. The other thing is, in Acts 27-37, the Holy Spirit did not record the number of souls on the ship as 276. He didn't say, or even as 276. But he said, instead, he said 200, 3 score, and 16. <coughs> 200, 3 score, and 16. Why? 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 I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Okay? Maybe it's just the way they wrote things. I don't know. And is it really important to, to, for us to know that there was 276 people on board ship? Fact. Yeah. So, it is difficult to interpret the meaning of seven lambs. But, if we then have this question or no, knowledge about what the seven uh, lambs, or we know what lambs represent, then maybe we can make this connection... So when I started off looking at this well, many weeks ago, it says, uh, why seven? Why seven lambs? And then later on, in Leviticus chapter 23, in the same sacrifice, another two lambs were sacrificed. Okay? Another two were sacrificed. The question is, why seven? Why not just one? Okay, why, why not just one? It wasn't because it was seven people, one for each person. It was just seven lambs, a group of seven lambs. Well, the answer then rests in the number. Okay, that rests in the number. And if you know about uh, biblical numerology or Bible numbers, then you begin to make a connection that the number seven has meaning has meaning, okay? Seven is the number of completion. And that's why when we looked at Christ's sacrifice, when <coughs> he called out, it is finished, it is accomplished, it was complete. It was complete. This number seven has a idea of completion, a spiritual perfection, spiritual per perfection. So, the seven days in a week. Seventh day is the day of rest. It's not eight days. It's not nine days. It's not one day. But God, could He have created the world in one day? Could He have created everything in one day? Yes. But He took how many days to create everything? Six. And the seventh He rested. Did He need to rest because He got tired? No. Seven is the number of completion. Seven is the number of completion. Okay, seven days a week. There are, how many notes in the scale? Musical scale. How many? Eight. Eight. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti. But do is the same as do. So there's seven. Okay. I'll blame the teacher. I'll blame the music teacher for that one. Okay, the seven notes in the scale. And then it repeats again. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti. And then do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti. Do, re, mi, fa, sol. The seven notes in the scale. Seven notes. 
How many colours of the rainbow? Seven. Roy G. Berg. Remember that from your slides? So there's seven colours of the rainbow. There's seven planets. Okay? There is seven dispensations. Seven is the number of completion. The seventh feast, when we'll look at this when we get to it, but the seventh month is the trumpet atonement and tabernacles. The feast of unleavened bread was for seven days. So throughout all of scripture, there's the number seven pops up, pops up. Even in nature, number seven pops up. And if we go back to Leviticus chapter 23, look at verse 15, it says, And count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, how many Sabbaths? Seven Sabbaths shall be complete. <coughs> the number seven is the number of completion or spiritual perfection. Spiritual perfection. How long is the tribulation period? Seven years. Okay? Seven years. How long is the church age? Well, how long is a piece of string? I don't know. But is it going to be a multiple of seven? I don't know. We, did, we know when it started. We just have to work out when it finishes. When we're raptured. And then when we're at the judgment seat of Christ and we're waiting for our turn to be judged, we can do a little bit of maths and work out see if it was a multiple of seven. Because we'll have new bodies, so we'll be very mathematical. Eh? It's going to be exciting. Seven days. Seven is the number of completion or spiritual perfection. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So keep, a, keep your um, bookmark in, in Leviticus. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So when we look, when, when I first approached this and I thought, now, the picture of a lamb throughout all of Scripture seems to represent Christ. So why seven and not just one? Until you look at the number, the number is significant. Seven lambs, because seven is the number of completion. Okay? And when Christ cried out on the cross, it is finished. It was complete. It was finished. His work on earth uh, was finished. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done <coughs> away. So there's part Okay, it's not revelation, but God's word is going to be complete, perfect, when that is perfect is coming, we're looking at completion. Okay, completion. So, if that's the case, if the number is significant, which obviously it is, because whose feasts are these? Christ, or God's feasts, right? They all point to Christ. So if we go back to Leviticus chapter 23, these must mean something. The Jewish people did not go to God and say, Lord, we want these feasts. These are God's feasts. If you go back to verse 2, uh, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, in Leviticus chapter 23, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. So these are not the people's feasts, these are God's feasts. And so God has instituted them for a reason. And as we've already seen from the Passover, that the blood which covered them speaks of Christ. We are covered or washed by the blood of Christ. Then as we went through every feast, we saw Christ in those feasts. 
This feast of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, we saw that the two um, people groups, Gentiles and Jews, came together. But now in the sacrifice itself, we see Christ. And the number is significant. And so the seven dispensations, Christ is God the Father's sacrificial lamb. Genesis. Let's go through a few passages. I just want to, as I'm taking that nail, I've put it into place now. I'm going to hammer it home. Well, actually, allow the Lord to hammer it home using His Word. Genesis 22. Genesis 22 and verse 8. Notice that when Abraham took his son up, uh, up on the mountain, same place where Christ would uh, be crucified and be sacrificed as a lamb. And God the Father had, <coughs> had asked Abraham to sacrifice his son. Okay, And as they were going, um, verse 7, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And in verse 8, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they both went uh, of them together. Now notice, notice very carefully. Abraham said to his son, what did he say to his son? God will provide himself a lamb. He didn't say God will provide a lamb for us to sacrifice, but God will provide himself a lamb. And who is the lamb? Who is the lamb of God? The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. And God himself provided himself a lamb. Why did he need to, to sacrifice a lamb? For the sins of man. And that lamb was the Lord Jesus Christ. For the sins of man. So we see as, as the sacrifice begins to take place. It doesn't really finish. But Ab uh, Isaac is then the equivalent of uh, God the Son. But then you see the uh, ram caught in the thicket a little later which they sacrificed. So Genesis 22 verse 8. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Ezekiel 45. Turn to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 45 verse 15. So the lambs were important. They had to be without blemish. They had to be from the first year. But also the number seven uh, was important. It represented uh, the number of completion. And uh, Ezekiel 45 verse 15. And one lamb out of the flock, out of 200 out of the fat pastures of Israel, for a meat offering and for a burnt offering and for a peace offering, to make reconciliation for them saith the Lord God. So a lamb was taken out of the flock to be sacrificed. Now we just have one lamb here. We saw the word lamb used in the Old Testament in Genesis and how many Christs are there? There's only one Christ. There's only one sacrifice, right? But the seven, the number seven is the important bit because the number seven represents the number of completion. So it's seven lambs. That means the completed work of God. And that's why when God uh, died, Christ died on the cross, he said, it is finished. It is complete. The work is accomplished. It is finished. Turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John 
verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming, uh, Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Now, here the word Lamb is capitalized. Okay? The Lord Jesus Christ is the Lamb. That's his name. He is God's Lamb. God will supply. His Lamb, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Okay? And down to verse 36. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God of God, the Lamb of God. And so all through Scripture, all through Scripture, when we read the word Lamb, and, and to do with the sacrifice or anything like that, we should automatically begin to think of Christ. And the number of lambs, and that we read in, in Leviticus chapter 23, the number seven is then significant uh, with Christ. So seven lambs would represent the shedding of blood throughout each dispensation throughout each dispensation we are seeing the completed work of God so not only was it uh, efficacious or, or good for the people at that time when Christ died on the cross his blood was not shed only for the people at that time but is also applicable to us today and for all the ages prior to that okay Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Hebrews 9, verse 22. Now, remember what they did in the Old Testament. Remember that this, the book of Hebrews is written to the Jews in the main. Now, written by Paul, um, but written to the Hebrews because the comparison of the sacrifices in the Old Testament with the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the comparison that is made throughout all the book of Hebrews. How Christ was the final sacrifices that ended all sacrifices. And that uh, we read that in, in verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without <coughs> shedding of blood is no remission. So there needed to be shed blood for the remission of sins. The wage of sin is death. Okay? When the high priest uh, slaughtered an animal or killed an animal... And he took that blood into the Holy of Holies. He sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat. For the sins, firstly he had to atone for his own sins, but also when he went in there and sprinkled the blood, it was for the sins of the people. But it was only a covering for sin. It only covered sin. Okay? So when Christ uh, died on the cross, he paid the whole penalty uh, for sin. Let's go to chapter 10. Uh, there it says, For the Lord having a shadow of good things to come. The law, the sacrifices in the Old Testament, was a shadow of good things to come. Because almost all things, that doesn't mean all, it's almost all things. There was something that was really lacking. And that was the sacrifice of Christ. So, and, um, and not the very image of the things can never, with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers there unto perfect. They couldn't become perfect. Because even though almost all things doesn't mean all things. It's almost all things. Okay? And then when Christ came, they, uh, the perfect sacrifices which ended all sacrifices. And so the blood of Christ cleanses all sin. All sin. First John. So just keep on going. Turn to the right a little ways to First John. Not the Gospel of John, but uh, the letter. 
First John chapter 1, verse 7. First John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. Okay? The blood of Christ cleanses us from cleanseth cleanses cleanseth us from all sin. Okay? From all sin. And if we say we have no sin, then of course we deceive ourselves. Turn over to chapter 2 and verse 2. He is the propitiation or the, the, the accepted sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, says John, but for the sins of the whole world. When Christ died on the cross, he did not just die for those people at that particular time, or he didn't die for from that time forward, but for all people. All people. Okay? And he died for the sins of the whole world. All believers are covered by the work of Christ. It is finished. Well, actually, that's the wrong word, isn't it? It shouldn't be covered. It should be finished. We're washed. We're not just covered over. We're washed. We're cleansed by the blood of Christ. It is finished. Completed. Hence, the seven lambs. The completed spiritual work of Christ. He came to pay the price for sin. Yes, one lamb, one Christ, which was sacrificed. But the number 7 in Leviticus chapter 23 speaks of his completed work. His completed work. So let's go back to John chapter 19, where we were, uh, which Johan read to us in the Bible reading uh, this evening. John chapter 19. So let's pick it up from verse 28. So John chapter 19, we'll pick it up from verse 28. <clears throat> so after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now, what? Accomplished. There's nothing more they could do except give up the ghost and die. <coughs> okay? That the scripture might be fulfilled, saith I thirst. And, and of course we know that comes from the, the book of Psalms. <clears throat> then when we come down to verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head, gave up the ghost. It is finished. He knew that he had done everything that he could. It was accomplished what he came to do. What did Christ come to do? He came to be a king, didn't he? Isn't that though why they called out Hosanna, son of David? Glory to the king. He came to die. He came to die. He came to die on the cross. Yes, he will be the king of kings, lord of lords. Yes, the establishment of the kingdom will be after the tribulation period, the thousand year reign, and <coughs> beyond, and beyond. Don't think that after Christ comes, that he only reigns for a thousand years. He reigns for eternity. So after this, in verse 28, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, and he finishes that one last, one last prophecy, which David spoke about, in the book of Psalms. And he had taken that drink of vinegar. And then he said. It is finished. Bowed his head. And died. 
gave up the ghost. Gave up the ghost. It is finished. And so the, the importance then of this completed work. So when you look at Leviticus chapter uh, 23 and verse 17, 18, when it's talking about the wave loaves and, and 18, talks about the seven lambs. Seven lambs is the number of completion. It is his completed work. Just takes one lamb to do the work, but seven is the number of completion. And so, salvation on all men's behalf, Old Testament as well as New Testament alike. So Christ did not just die for a select few of pe few people. First Timothy chapter two. Okay, so in the first part of this chapter, um, Paul exhorts men everywhere to honour those that are in leadership and so that you can live a peaceable life in this world and not to be persecuted. You're only persecuted because you proclaim the name of the Saviour. But anyway, verse 4. Who will have God, that is, who will have all men to be saved? And to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God wants all men to be saved. It's not just to be saved from the point of his death onwards. But he wants everyone to be saved. And so the Old Testament sacrifices were a covering for sin. In preparation for the final sacrifices. And when Christ died on the cross, everything was washed away, washed clean. So he gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Okay, So the Old Testament saints had to wait until Christ died on the cross. And once Christ died on the cross, they could then be taken out of Abraham's bosom and taken to heaven. And taken to heaven. And so he gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And in, in, in verse 7 says, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. Okay? I lie not. So he's then uh, testifying. Let's turn back to John chapter 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 3. John, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay? God wants to save all men. All men. Michaela. Okay. Then there's seven Sabbaths. Now, let's go back to Leviticus chapter 23. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 23. We noticed that at the beginning of this feast, there was a particular time period that they had to wait from the last feast. So they had to count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the verse 15 here, from the day that he brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Seven Sabbath shall be complete. And then 
even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Seven Sabbaths. So that hints again to the creation week. The beginning and the end. Christ's work from eternity to eternity. Completion. Uh, the seven lambs represent Christ and his finished, completed work on the cross of Calvary. In verse 18. Saw that, uh, beginning to see that in verse 18. Seven lambs. So one lamb. It's a sacrifice, but in this case, the seven lambs, which the seven is the significant number. And these lambs represent Christ's uh, completed, perfect work. The lambs also needed to be perfect as a perfect representation of Christ's perfect work. Okay? So these lambs had to be perfect because they represented Christ, who was perfect. So they couldn't just take any old lamb. They had to take the best one. Without blemish. Okay? From the flock. And seven of them. Because they were to represent Christ, who was the perfect one. And, of, and the perfect representation of Christ's perfect uh, work. So... Then we come to this new meat offering. Okay, so as we go through to continue with this <coughs> verse 18. Uh, and ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs. Now we know where the seven now. Why seven? It's the number is significant because it's the number of completion. Without blemish of the first year. We know now what that represents. And one young bullock and two rams. And they shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord with their meat offering. Now here's the meat offering. And, uh, and their drink offering, even an offering made by fire of sweet savour unto uh, the Lord. So if we go back to verse 16. Or well, part of the same feast, we haven't departed from the feast at all. It's the same feast. Even unto the morrow after the seventh uh, Sabbath, ye shall number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Okay? So it's a new meat offering unto the Lord. It's not something which is old, but something which is new. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Um, so, a new meat offering. Let's turn to Numbers 28. Numbers chapter 28, turn to the right, here in Leviticus, and verse 26. <clears throat> verse 26, also in the day of the first fruits. When ye bring a new meat offering unto the Lord, after your weeks be out, ye shall have a holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work. So, the f in the day of the first fruits, now if you just keep your finger there, and just flip back to verse 17, or the end of verse 17 of Leviticus chapter 23. So the end of Leviticus chapter 23 verse 17 it says there, they are the first fruits unto the Lord. Which is the same thing that's talking about here in Numbers chapter 28. Okay? Uh, they, the day of the first fruits, when you shall bring a new meat offering unto the Lord. So we, we're looking at this new meat offering term. What is significant about a new meat offering rather than an Old meat offering. We know what seven lambs is. Now, all these things are, are burnt offering unto the Lord. We see a new meat offering. Now, the word meat doesn't necessarily have to be meat. It's a meal offering uh, in a sense too. Nehemiah chapter 10. Nehemiah. Nehemiah 
chapter 10. Chapter 10, <coughs> the cupbearer. Someone like to read that? Save me time. For the showbread and for the continual meat offering and for the continual burnt offering of the Sabbaths, the new moon, for the set feast and for the holy things. For the sin offerings to make an atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. Okay. So we see there that these the meat offering was a particular time, and uh, it says new moon, doesn't it, doesn't it? Yep. yep. For the new moon, so that's something which is new, and this one here is a new meat offering uh, to do with that. Let's turn to Ezekiel 45 again. Ezekiel 45. Verse 17. <coughs> and we were in 15 uh, previously. Now we'll go down to verse 17. And it shall be the prince's part to give burnt offering and meat offerings and drink offerings in the feasts. Okay? And in the new moons. And in the Sabbaths. In all solemnities of the house of Israel. He shall prepare the sin offering and the meat offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings to make reconciliation for the house of Israel. So now we're making a little bit more of a connection here. It's to do with reconciliation or being reconciled. So a meat offering was to do with reconciliation. Reconciliation. Who is the one who reconciled us to God? The Lord Jesus Christ. And so when you look at Leviticus chapter 23 in verse 18, the whole verse itself is to do with Christ. This whole feast in verse 16, it talks about the new meat offering. It's not a reconciliation of the meat offering in the Old Testament as to reconciling uh, Israel to God the Father, but the new meat offering which represents the Lord Jesus Christ and reconciling the world unto Him. That through that sacrifice that not only Israel, but the whole world would be reconciled by the blood of Christ. He is the, the reconciliation. He makes that reconciliation. Uh, not any apostle, like the church that I used to belong to, they believed that the chief apostle was the reconciliation. There was the man between God and men. And that was the chief apostle. In the Roman Catholic Church, it's the Pope that stands between God and man. But Christ says he is the new meat offering. Not any longer the old meat offering which reconciled Israel unto God, which covered them for their sin, but when Christ died, it's a new meat offering, which then took away all the sin, and He is the reconciliator between us and God. Or the, the, the word propitiation, the satisfaction, the sat satisfied God the Father could only be the Lord Jesus Christ's death on the cross. So, it seems to imply ye must be born again. Ye must be born again. It's a new meat offering. If you want to be reconciled to God, you must be born again. John chapter 3. Okay, Nicodemus. Nicodemus. 
came to Jesus by night. Okay, he was a, a ruler, teacher, wanted to know more things about uh, Christ. He was a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews. And he, in verse 2 he says, um, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher and come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Okay? And later on, it says that yet he had done so many miracles before him, yet they believed not on him. But here Nicodemus, and we've already looked at Nicodemus, how he became a believer. And verse 3, Jesus answered, said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Ye must be born again. Verse 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. It's an imperative. If you want to enter into heaven, if you want your sins <coughs> forgiven, ye must be born again. It's a must. It's not maybe or should be. Ye must be born again. And so when we come to this meat offering, which is all part and parcel of the Feast of Pentecost, that not only are the seven lambs important for the completed <coughs> work of Christ, but also this new meat offering. Not the old meat offering, which reconciled the, the people, the Israelites, to God. But now we have this new meat offering, which reconciles the world. Ye must be born again. It is indeed a new covenant. A uh, new covenant. I'm going to leave that there. Actually, how many slides have I got? I've still got a wee way to go. But we're getting pretty close to the end. Of, let's just see how many slides. Just flip through. Oh, yeah, we've got a... Yeah, okay. We've got to go and look at the... Miracles of Christ and feeding the folk and how many baskets were left is also very significant and uh, things like that. So we'll continue looking at that next week. So the new covenant, so this new meat offering uh, to do with a new covenant, not the old meat offering, as we saw in Ezekiel chapter 45 verse 17, which is sacrifice or the meal offering, the meat offerings, reconcile the people to God. It's now the whole world. There's no Jew or Gentile, bond or free, all are in Christ. Let's close in a word of prayer and uh, then we'll sing our final hymn. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to continue to open your word. And Father, what a blessing it is to see the Lord Jesus Christ in these feasts. What a blessing it is to, to read about the completed work of Christ. Father, Indeed, it is finished. It is complete. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that all these sacrifices turn out to be new and fresh because of Christ and his work on the cross. <coughs> the first fruits, a new meat offering, and the seven lambs. And Father, what a privilege it is to see the Lord Jesus Christ in every page of Scripture. Father, we do pray then that we would hide your word in our heart. And Father, we may be able to share that with others so that they too can be excited and, 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 and enthused about coming to thee. And if they're not saved, Father, that they would come to that saving knowledge of you. Father, we do praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.